Hi everyone, and welcome to Clips by Kurosawa, where we'll be watching and discussing Japanese writer and director Akira Kurosawa's eight films, featured on Letterboxd's top 250 narrative features list. The film we are discussing today is the fifth film by Kurosawa I have seen, so I invite you to watch his movies alongside me and come back to hear my thoughts. I'd love to hear yours in the comments section. On today's episode, we are discussing Throne of Blood. Kurosawa's Throne of Blood, released in 1957, is a Japanese adaptation of Shakespeare's classic play Macbeth. In this version, the audience follows Takitori Washizu and his wife, Lady Asaji Washizu, similar to Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. The film follows the plot of the play with a prophecy in the beginning of the movie that causes Washizu to murder his leader at the urging of his wife. Other than Shakespeare's influence, the Japanese art of No was a big influence on Kurosawa in this film, No being from a dance drama that had been performed since the 14th century in Japan. Throne of Blood is still considered to be one of the best adaptations of Macbeth and pulled numerous awards upon its release. Throne of Blood is ranked 169 in Letterboxd and just might be my favorite Kurosawa film yet. The performances, in my opinion, are the strongest part of this film. Toshiro Mifune is obviously not capable of turning in a bad performance, and Izazu Yamada really steals the show despite her limited screen time. Toshiro Mifune's character, Washizu, descent into corruption and paranoia is so well done. He expresses so many emotions at once and turns in a complex performance. Yamada as Lady Washizu is incredible as well. As soon as she appears on the screen, she appears as a cunning, ambitious, and tough woman, and really pulls off her portrayal of Lady Macbeth. A little bit past halfway through the film, while Washizu and his wife are at a dinner celebration, the look on both actors' faces are expressed so well. Lady Washizu slowly losing her confidence while trying to defy the prophecy, and Washizu's faces of guilt, worry, and madness. The single look from both actors almost shows where the characters are now and where they are heading in the future. Not to mention Minoru Chiaki's performances as Miki. His expression when Washizu brings back their Lord Commander after his death as both suspicious but not surprised is super complex and adds to both the dynamic between Miki and Washizu, but also Washizu's ultimate downfall. The overall scope of this movie really stood out to me. Being one of Kurosawa's earlier films in the series, I wasn't expecting it to be this high production value. From the set to the wide shots and the cinematography, I think the overall look and scope is my favorite of any Kurosawa film I have seen thus far. The castles on the set were built on the slopes of Mount Fuji for the fog effect, and it really pays off. The fog adds to the suspense, darkness, and mysteriousness that is the tone of this film. Something else that adds to the tone is the composition and cinematography. While the cinematography in the films by Kurosawa I have seen so far have been fantastic, the composition and camera work in Throne of Blood is my favorite. It's hard to express why the cinematography in this film stands out so much. The flat background and wide shots are all composed with such precision. But I think the best way to put it is that an adaptation of Macbeth is supposed to have this look. There's almost an eerie feel throughout the movie, much thanks to the combination of lighting and composition. I have to mention the special effects in this film and how well done they are. In the scene when the spirit disappears, the cut and transition between shots is some of the smoothest I have seen in any film, much less one from the 50s. Although it's truly just a well-timed cut, it looks about as realistic as you can hope for. Also, the final scene in which Washizu dies features great special effects. Apparently the arrows used are real and were shot by skilled archers. Even though this is more of a practical than special effect, it looks great and as accurate as well. Also, the cut when Washizu gets shot in the next looks pretty good, although not as smooth as the cut when the spirit leaves. The themes in this movie are obviously related to the overall themes of Macbeth, like power corrupts and trying to control your fate. When we are first introduced to Washizu, he seems like a decent man, who's trying to follow orders and play his part. He even says he doesn't want to be the head of Forest Castle. I think after the first part of the prophecy is fulfilled, which is Washizu becoming leader of the North Castle, he slowly starts to become corrupt and tries to control his destiny after the bit of power he gains. Lady Washizu obviously plays a big part of this due to her persuasion and power over her husband. Lady Washizu starts to plant a seed in her husband's head that Miki has told their lordship about the prophecy, 
and how they are planning to take Washazu out. The paranoia starts to grow, which causes Washazu to try and fulfill the prophecy himself by killing his lordship, leading to Washazu and Lady Washazu's fall from grace. While many different themes and ideas can be pulled out of this movie or other adaptations of Macbeth, I think the main idea is to sometimes let things come to you. It's hard not to try to make things happen for yourself, especially when a prophecy tells you it'll come true. But like Washazu, sometimes when we try to interfere with our fate, we will ultimately be led to it. I rated this film 5 stars on Letterboxd and would recommend it to anyone wanting to watch a great adaptation of Macbeth that looks as good as any. Let me know your thoughts on Throne of Blood and join me next week where we will be watching and discussing the critically acclaimed Ikiru, ranked number 14 on Letterboxd and one of my most anticipated films. Thank you.